everyone and welcome to It's Verona's podcast series on, uh, on special issue on uh, COVID-19. Uh, today we have the great pleasure to have with us uh, Rod Thornton. Uh, Rod is a senior lecturer at the, Dep the Defense Studies uh, Department of King's College London. And prior to academia, Rod has served for uh, nine years uh, in the British Army uh, in an infantry uh, regiment. Um, Rod has written a book uh, titled Asymmetric Warfare, Threat and Response in the 21st Century. Uh, but of course, he has uh, many other publications. And above all, Rod is a colleague of Mikhail and, and myself at uh, Defense Studies. So with Rod today, we are um, talking about COVID because he recently published a, a piece on the website of King's College London, which is titled What COVID-19 Revealed about the UK's capacity to deal with the changing nature of warfare and we thought that uh, that from that piece we can uh, that there is a opportunity to ex to infer uh, to, to have a, a very interesting discussion uh, and that's why we're here today uh, with him uh, Rod hello welcome hello hi hi uh, so to start with uh, uh, before and then we will uh, expand upon uh, your article. How has Britain performed in terms of strategy as art and in terms of strategy as science in this crisis? We know that the military like to uh, look at strategy through these two angles: strategy as science, strategy as art. Uh, over uh, to you. Yeah, I mean the military might want to look at strategy, but I think in the UK in particular, philosophically as a country, we don't like to look at strategy. The strategy is long term. Strategy is thinking far ahead. I think we in Britain don't like to apply any particular template to what happens in the future as, as a country, as a, as a government, as a, as a people. We tend to have this English phrase to muddle through, i.e. we can just get through anything no matter what. So we don't have to plan for anything. It will just happen kind of serendipitously. It will be successful that we'll have a health service in covid uh, that will can cope with the, the whole emergency, but we didn't really plan for this. We weren't in the same position as other countries which did plan for COVID-19, and we weren't just ready. So the whole idea of strategy as a country, even though the military themselves might want to, because it's part of their bread and butter to actually study strategy, the government itself, which does the, the grand strategy rather than the military strategy, there is no really grand strategy coming from the government. It's more this idea of, okay, whatever happens, we can get through it. So planning is kind of somewhat antithetical, or long-term planning is antithetical to the, the British approach to um, problems. So we don't really kind of set out solutions before they arrive. We try and fix them when they do arrive. Uh, thank you, Rod. And getting more into um, the details of your piece. So I'm just quoting a, a phrase from that, which got my attention. The character of peer state warfare has changed. It is more about generating creeping events in the homeland of an adversary without using kinetic force. Uh, could you expand on this point? Yeah, um, what happened was, I mean, the Gulf Wars, the two Gulf Wars in 1991 and 2003 showed to the Russians and the Chinese that their militaries would be no match for the American military in particular and the, the rest of the Western NATO as well. So they, they then realized that they had to find a, another way if they were attacked in the future by NATO in whatever shape, manner or form, that they had to kind of rethink the whole approach to how warfare should be conducted. The second issue that the Russians and the Chinese were faced with was this idea of the spread of democracy. This wonderful idea for the West that we can spread democracy around the world and we'll have this kind of Francis Fukuyama end of history moment where every, every country is a democracy, therefore there's no more wars. Now, this idea of a spread of democracy to both China and Russia is a threat. Because it's, it's a threat to their governments. It's a threat to the Putin regime and to the Chinese regime. So both countries, and Russia in particular, who put this more down in their doctrine, want to say, OK, we are under threat from the West because of this spread of democracy through kind of Western information warfare, uh, ideas of trying to make the Russian people more kind of, uh, to protest more against the Putin regime. We saw this a lot in 2011, when there were a lot of street protests in Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, by elements of the Russian population who, were, who wanted Putin 
to be removed from power. This was perceived by the Putin regime to be organized by the West, by the Americans uh, in, in particular. So that was, the, again, that was, so that was the idea that, okay, the future was, if you wanted to defeat your adversaries, you had to do it internally through the protest p potential of a population, through information warfare, through under mining a society through the use of information and it's moved on now to what i get more or less using using cyber as well so that you you're not just have a go at kind of psychologically information both russia and china have this idea of information psychological warfare and information technical warfare information psychological warfare is all the information warfare about trying to influence people trying to influence their decision making cyber technical and information technical is more about trying to kind of destroy uh, various kind of internal means of a state running itself, the kind of state infrastructure. And obviously that comes a lot later in the process. Mostly now we are subject in the West to Western and, sorry, Russian and Chinese information warfare. So the information warfare is designed very, very slowly to undermine our, our countries from within. Now for the Russians and the Chinese, this weakens us as, as states and makes them feel safer. The weaker we are in the West, the Americans, the British, etc., the safer the Russians and the Chinese feel because they then think that we as countries in the West have to deal with our own domestic problems more than deal with the problems um, created by China and Russia, which gives China and Russia greater latitude on the international stage to do whatever they want to do. The Chinese in their islands in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the East China Sea and in the and Western Pacific, the Russians in Syria, and the Russians in places like Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. So the, the weaker we are in the West, the less likely we are to oppose what they do on the international stage, which in a zero-sum sense makes them more powerful as we become weaker. So that's a general approach to warfare, uh, the changing character of warfare in the, in the kind of 21st century. Thank you, Rod. And a final question from me. Um, do you think this, the, the, the kind of post-Cold uh, post War military commitment uh, where the UK and also the US were involved um, represented a strategic distraction? Uh, thinking about COVID. Uh, in what sense? I mean, uh, it, was, well, it, it is a distraction, uh, COVID-19. Um, it makes us think more about what happens internally in our countries. And are we prepared to deal with an, an internal emergency, be it you know, naturally occurring like a, like a pandemic or an end of, uh, pandemic uh, like COVID-19, but also if this is what happens with a man, uh, with a, a natural kind of uh, event, it could also come from a man-made event, like, a, like an AI-enabled cyber warfare attack, which destroys more or less everything in a country, so nothing really works anymore. Electricity doesn't, doesn't work, water doesn't come out of taps, all these kind of things that you can theoretically generate through an AI, artificial intelligence-enabled cyber warfare attack. So COVID-19 kind of gives an idea of what other countries could do to our countries in the West if they can create some sort of synthetic COVID-19, a synthetic event where they, in a man-made sense, create the same effects, which kind of undermines our country from within. So again, we've started to look, again, with this idea of COVID-19, to look internally far more than we did before, when all our kind of, kind of ideas about security were based on what happened abroad in somebody else's country. Now we have to really think about what happens inside our country and not just the terrorism threat, which has kind of moved on. But that always used to dominate domestic security thinking terrorism. But now it's this other idea of how can a man-made COVID-19, a man-made attack, like a cyber warfare attack, how can it manifest itself? And how can we as countries mitigate these effects? So security is a lot now about how to mitigate internal effects created by a, a, a foreign entity which is designed to more or less cre recreate a kind of COVID-19 experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod. This was a very, very interesting and fascinating. Um, I just have one big question for you, given everything that you said. So if the focus has been moving towards more domestic uh, aspects, right? Uh, and COVID, uh, probably. So even if it came, I mean, from abroad, but we can still see like the big domestic implications. Then uh, I do not want to sound too simplistic, but what do we do? 
in terms of strategy. I mean, you said that the UK, and uh, if I may add, maybe many other countries, but, but let's just focus on the UK. You said that the UK lacks strategy, that the UK doesn't really like about thinking about strategy. So given everything that you said, apologies for my digression, again, what should we do? What, what would be your biggest piece of recommendation? Well, my biggest piece of recommendation would be that we have to think long term. We have to create what we call redundancy, resilience. If you have state resilience, you build up the capacity to mitigate the effects of any particular man-made or natural disaster within your country. So what could you do? But you have to think then think it long term. You have to think, okay, what do we do? Well, we have to build up stocks of, say, personal protective equipment, for instance, medical equipment. Let's build up a big stock of that. Okay, let's create a, a health service with the capacity to expand on its own if need be, and not just have this health service that to kind of just does make do and mend, as they say in Britain. It's just about can cope with the situation now, and it can't cope with a major expansion of um, casualties, uh, ill people uh, trying to you know, come into the health service. So things like that, that you build up within your country, like we used to have in the Cold War, we used to have stocks of everything, just in case there was a nuclear holocaust, that we in, the, in Britain and in other Western countries, you build up a, a big um, stockpile of equipment that could be used in an emergency. But now we've lost that whole Cold War idea. We, are, we now have governments which think very much short term. Democracies don't think in long term because they are democracies. Governments don't think about what happens in 20 years because they won't be in power in 20 years. They have to about think about things that happen in the next three or four years because they want to get re-elected. They have to do popular things. And they don't want to waste money, what they would say would be wasting money, on building up redundancy. It's really expensive, but will not benefit them uh, as, 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 as a government, as a, as a political party, because you're spending for 10, 20, 30 years down the line. And people in the country will ask, well, why are you spending this money? We, we, we're not seeing the benefits of all this, this kind of idea of developing redundancy, resilience, mitigation that you can look for, because we are democracies. Other countries, China and Russia, can think long term. They can build up the idea that we are going to create state resilience a long time into the future. Um, but we don't. We can't do that. Very good. Thank you, Rod. Uh, one very, very, very brief follow-up question. A U.S. general once said that uh, if even physical fitness may help a population to uh, be better prepared, right, in, uh, uh, in terms of everything. Would you agree with that statement? And uh, if so, or if not, uh, which other areas, uh, you have mentioned resilience, which other areas would you focus uh, your efforts on? Uh, as for the British public, obviously, I mean. Well, I mean, I think, if, if, I think the British public themselves realise now that one of the, um, you are more vulnerable to the COVID-19 effects if you are unfit, if you are unhealthy, if you're obese, then you are more likely to, to be a victim of COVID-19. This is, I think, generated in the last few weeks. I think we've seen this idea that uh, the population wants to get fitter because it can see the writing on the wall. If I'm not fit, I may be kind of a victim of this, this, this pandemic. So this is going to give people a big jolt in terms of health, in terms of fitness. Because in the last few years in the West, in America and Britain and in other countries, there is this idea of, okay, uh, people are working a lot harder, I think, have no real time to do exercise. Yeah. They're not walking to work. They're not cycling to work. They're getting public transport or, or they're in their cars. As people have become richer, they have more cars. They can drive to work. They don't need to walk anywhere. Uh, they don't need to exercise. Um, so uh, this whole idea of people getting natural exercise by walking to and from work, for instance, it does no longer happen. So uh, this, is, this does make certain countries like West, like America and Britain, we are an unhealthy population. But I think it's worldwide. I think it is. It isn't just the West. I think it's it's a worldwide phenomena that in Korea or in China or in other countries in the East, you still get unhealthy people, and because of the same spread of wealth, when we to physically work hard in physical labor, we we we're, we're naturally fitter. But I think well, I don't get into Big, big ideas about the, the kind of demographics, but, but we are unfit as, as people in the world and getting more unfit as we speak, except for the, the jolt given us by COVID-19, which 
Hang on, we need to get fit, otherwise we ourselves might be victims. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Zeus and Michele. Thank you.